Hi, my name is Kevin Cameron. I shoot video and take photographs for the IEEE Computer Society Silicon Valley chapter. This talk by David Patterson on 50 years of computer architecture uh, was shot at the TI Auditorium. Unfortunately, the main camera failed to produce usable video, so we're working with two lesser streams, but most of the audio is there, and we'll be starting at slide three. You haven't missed much, and there's plenty more to come. So software stack, even different I/O devices, and and niches and business models. So IBM boldly decided uh, that they would invent binary compatibility, invent the idea that computer architecture be defined independent of the machine, and software would run everywhere. And they bet the company on this IBM System 360 instruction set that would take over all four lines. Now, one of the biggest problems for uh, computer design then and today is control. That's the hardest thing to do. So how are they going to get all these independent business units to agree on the same instruction set? And they decided that they were going to bet on microprogramming. This was invented by Maurice Wiltz, one of the pioneers of computing in the, one of the first computers. And he thought it would be a lot easier to design control if you did it via a memory. And the technology he was using in 1958, the logic was more expensive than ROM or RAM, and ROM was cheaper than RAM, and it was also faster, so let's specify control as a memory. So they decided they were going to bet the way that they were going to have a common instruction set across these lines would be have different microprograms for different hardware sets from 8-bit wide data all the way to 64-bit wide data. So here are four of the models that they uh, invented uh, are announced on the same day, so from 4 to 64 bits. And the microcode here, as it shows, goes across, the narrowest one was 50 bits, 4,000 microinstructions, 50 bits wide, versus a little bit less than 3,000 instructions, 87 bits wide. And basically, for microcode, uh, the kind of the more parallel the data path, the wider the micro instructions were, and it didn't take as many steps as it did to be able to execute them. So it was wider and and not as deep as typically done. And uh, and then they had whoops, they had different speeds of uh, of memory and different speeds of uh, clock rates. And in today's dollars, they were you know, amazing, impressively exp impressive. They would rent them to you for anywhere between a half a million and two million dollars in today's dollars. So I can bet the company that on the idea of binary compatibility, and they won that bet. So I can bet it in the, and it came out in 1964 and dominated mainframe computers. Uh, and they, there's a descendant of that still running today. So that's the mainframes. Then comes integrated circuit technology that wasn't part of the mainframes. Now RAMs are about the same speed as ROMs. Uh, uh, it, but you know, good Moore, Moore's law is in full force, and so memory is going to get bigger, which allowed bigger, more complicated microprograms, which allowed bigger, more complicated instruction sets, which we call complex instruction set computers. And the shining example of that is the VAX computer, the VAX 11780. It had 5,000 lines of 96-bit microcode, but so you kind of see it was a lot more complicated than the 360, and it, and it was, but a very successful product. Back here in Silicon Valley, uh, Gordon Moore of Moore's fame was pals with Gordon Bell of Digital Equipment Corporation, who was the architect of the VAX. They, and so because they were pals, uh, Gordon Moore understood that microprocessors were probably going to become more, more significant and that the next instruction set that they did after the 8080 was probably going to last for the rest of the company. He had enough uh, in instincts on that from Clark and Gordon Bell. So what he did was decide to start a project in Portland, Oregon to be the future of the company, to set the instruction set for the rest of the life of the company. So he hired all these PhDs in computer science, put them to Oregon, and they were supposed to invent the future. And it was by far the most ambitious one. It's called the IA, IAPX 432. It, had, it was a 32-bit address space at the time when even the 8080 was not a, 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 wasn't even a 16-bit address space. It was capability-based, that means the security was built into the address space. They weren't limited, they would have small code size, so instructions could be any number of bits. They could have 3-bit instructions, 17-bit buttons, there's no 
uh, no restrictions on it. And it was really big microprograms to get all that complexity in it. They even wrote their own operating system in the esoteric language ADA. So, that, so they're trying to do it in the future. The problem was with a bunch of PCs and crew and did in the future is they were late. <laughs> uh, but when they finally came out, they weren't modest. Uh, this is a quote when it was announced in 1981. Uh, you know, this is going to be, uh, it, you know, every, every decade something comes along that's revolutionary and, uh, you know, it's going to be as big a difference as analog computers were in the past. Um, but unfortunately for the people in Oregon, it, had, it was very complicated. Uh, it actually, the microprocessor didn't fit in one chip and it was performance. So Gordon Moore, trying to invent the future, they told them, by the way, we're going to be late. You know, so he started an emergency project. Uh, he gave a team at Intel one year, and what they had to do in that one year is invent a new instruction set and build a chip and bring it to market to their 16-bit successor they gave. So they spent three whole weeks of lab time designing the instruction set. <laughs> they had about about 10 person weeks altogether, given their schedule. They basically kind of made it a uh, extended the 8080 in ways, kind of made it, and it was supposed to be assembly language compatible with that. And uh, they extended the address best through uh, segmentation scenes 20 bits, and it was only 30,000 transistors, and they brought it to the market with no fanfare, unlike the 432. It just, it just so thanks to uh, Gordon Moore's great luck, uh, at, that IBM decided to get into the personal computer market, and it needed a microprocessor. So they picked, now the Motorola 68000 was a kind of an elegant instruction set of architecture, very similar to the IBM 360 instruction set, and that was the favorite going in. But when they wanted to ship the PC, the Motorola 68000 wasn't ready, it was late, and also Intel had made a version of the 8086 instruction set that had an 8-bit bus, which allowed them to build a cheaper PC. So they, IBM adopted it, they thought there'd be 250,000 units sold, and said it was 100 million sold. So 86 became an overnight success, and because of binary compatibility that IBM invented, it had an incredibly valuable franchise going forward. And so 86, this emergency replacement, had this incredibly bright future to this day. What happened to these microcode machines? This is a picture of John Cock, who was one of the famous computer scientists, Turing Award winner. And uh, he took a look and his group at IBM, he took a look at uh, these, these mainframe computers. He was building a, a simple pipeline processor called the 801. It wasn't a microprocessor, it was a big ECL computer. So he, he ported his experimental compiler to the big mainframes, and what they decided to do was not use the complicated instructions. They just used the plain old loads and source and simple instructions. And it ran faster. So if you didn't use the complicated stuff, it sped programs up, like factors of three. So that was at IBM. What about a DEC in Boston who did the VAX? Well, two of the engineers there carefully studied it and they looked at all of that microcode I told you about and they found that 20% of the instructions were responsible for 60% you know, of the microcode and they were only executed 0.2% of the time. So hardly used at all. So, and a lot of those were the complicated instructions. So now the transition to risk, you can think of it as basically Instead of having the RAM with this microcoded interpreters for these complex instructions, let's take out the interpreter and we'll just compile into these simple instructions. And, and instead of it being the memory for the control, it'll be an instruction cache. So that means that since it's a cache, as you change the program, we can reload that fast memory and we'll kind of tailor it to the machine. Um, and not only that, because it was pretty simple, you didn't have this microcode interpreter, it was much easier to pipeline so it could run faster. And uh, it turned out, as we saw before, the complex instructions weren't used all that frequently anyway, so how much were you giving up? By making it not very many transistors, the RISC architectures were able to fit a whole 32-bit data path, the control was relatively simple. And uh, by fitting it on one chip, of course, it was much more efficient. The problem was at the time, and I was just talking to uh, a colleague at the time, in the early 19, like 82, 83, there were terrific debates at conferences about risk versus sys. And one of the problems was we didn't have a scientific explanation for why risk was better. We figured that out later. 
In fact, my colleague John Hennessy wrote the first paper about this. So the insight that helped explain why risk could make sense is this formula. So the time per program, you know, how many seconds it takes to run, could be have these three factors. The number of instructions you execute per program, the average number of clock cycles per instruction, and then the time per, per clock cycle. So those three pieces. So what the explanation was is that, uh, and this was a study by the people on that slide from DEC, they did, they did a study to be able to see what happened. And for the CISC instructions, did execute fewer instructions, about half as many, but the average number of clock cycles was six times as many. So when you multiply those two things, risk was about three times as good as the VAX architecture in, in this case. And, that, and once we had that scientific explanation, oh, I see, with the microcoded interpreter, you have the clock cycles go up even though you execute more instructions, and people kind of got it. Then the question was, well, you know, it's interesting, technically, would it be successful in the marketplace? All right, uh, so what happens next is the, the PC era is in full flight. Uh, for the next, probably from the 80s through the mid 90s, RISCs have by far the fastest processors, and they're, they're all, the, the microprocessors are the fastest. So Intel didn't take that line down. They cleverly uh, came up with an idea to translate the x86 instructions into what are either called micro instructions or at AMD they're called risk instructions. So they took the hardware resources to take these kind of wild variable length, variable and clock cycles thing, which are hard to pipeline, and translate them in hardware and things that are easy to pipeline. And then they adopted some of the ideas that the risk guys came up with. One of the other ideas was super scalar. You're fetching more than one instruction sometimes, so they could do that. They did a kind of super pipeline, very deep pipeline. They could do that. Multi-level caches, they could do that. And then on their own, they copied from the old IBM 360 an idea of out of order execution, and they put that into their design. So given IBM's, given Intel's technology, they were able to overcome some of the disadvantaged instruction set and had the, the best microprocessors, the fastest microprocessors starting, I think, in around the, the, the second half of the 90s, and it eventually dominated servers, and they got up to, amazingly, 350 million per year. So that's the PC era. What about, what's the post-PC era? So the post-PC era is in the phones that we all carry with us. So let's say it started with the iPhone in 2007. So for, it's no longer chips that you buy from an Intel or an AMD, it's systems on a chip. So you're creating, Apple's creating a system on a chip, and they want to get IP to decide the process on the chips instead of buying things. So that's, that's a big change. And clearly, when it's on an SOC and you're integrating it yourself, you care a lot about die area fit in the SOC, and because it's mobile, energy is as big a deal as performance. So that's a change from before. And that, so that overhead of translating heart in from the x86 instruction set into the internal instruction set uh, was too expensive, for, uh, too much for, to be adopted, and also um, there was no binary compatibility had no value, right? that you weren't downloading things from the PC and running it on your phone. So that was two strikes against the x86, and they just don't appear, right? There's no phones with x86s in them, and almost no tablets that they do it. So, uh, X PCs are dwindling in the post-CPC era, not, su not surprising. They're dropping at about 8% per year in sales. Uh, mobile phones are up and to the right, internet things up and right. So, amazingly, last year there were 20 billion 32-bit uh, microprocessors, risk almost all risk processors uh, that were sold. Now, x86 still dominates the servers that are in the cloud, but the cloud's not that many machines, right? But one person estimated that all the companies together have 10 million servers there, so it's not that many chips in the cloud. They're very expensive chips, but it's just not very many of them. So today, 99% uh, of the processors are risk processors made today. I just thought, like, uh, just the ARM processor, where R, R and ARM is for risk, they shipped 100 billion chips with RISC processors in it. So uh, RISC won the, the second uh, war. <laughs> it's less of it. What happens next in computer architecture is an idea that's going to replace both of them. CIS, RISC, very long instruction word is a better idea than the other two. The idea is actually related to microcode. Uh, Josh Fisher, who came up with the idea of VLAW, he did his dissertation on microcode like NSC and I did. The wider, this wide instruction would control the data path with lots of things to control, and they would, as it showed in this example, 
depending on what you were doing, it would take a variable amount of execution time. Yeah, I think this was moving right. Um, so it shows there on the left, it would take maybe one clock cycle for the integer instructions, or three for the loads and stores. So it was the job of the software to put the right things into those slots, kind of like microcode, but they were going to do it by compiler. So that's the very long instruction work. Um, and so the architecture didn't have to do very much. It didn't have to check for dependencies between them. Uh, and it didn't have to, there was no interlocks or stuff like that. The compiler is supposed to do that. The compiler is going to fill all this in for us with, and make the hardware life easy. So it had this, the compiler was doing everything. It had to schedule the inter instruction parallelism. It had to avoid deadlocks. And that was the bet. So what happens next is the 32-bit address space, Intel successfully went from the 20-bit of the 86 to a 32-bit address space. This kind of widened the registers with the 386, but it was time to do that again. Now, now the problem, what they could have done is just made the x86 64-bit wide registers and solved it that way. But had they done that, they would have brought along AMD, which had rights to the x86. So that was a business problem. And then, you know, the x86, they spent three weeks architecting it, so it wasn't the world's best instruction set. Here's a chance for them to clean slate. So as I understand it, the head of Intel and HP were having golf, and they found out each of them was working on DLIW, so they decided to join forces. So now you had Intel, the best chip manufacturer in the world, and HP, a formidable computer company, agreeing to do the same instruction set. Uh, they called it, they didn't call it VLIW, they called it instead EPIC for explicitly parallel instruction computing, which is kind of a binary compatible version of the LIW. And they started working on 1994. Uh, it was announced that it was the successor, uh, and uh, AMD wasn't invited, so AMD was forced to just extend the x86 to 64 bits. Uh, at the time, there was tremendous fanfare about it, saying that VLIW is the future, RISC and CISC was the past. And several companies, just once it was announced that HP and Intel are going to build the next computer architecture, they just gave up on what they were doing. SGI, others just abandoned it and said, OK, I, you may not like it, but we have no choice. We have to use Itanium because uh, that's got to be the future here. So their first chip was late. Uh, you know, and it kind of it took a mulligan on the first chip, but the uh, other other chips came along. So then, what happened? So what happened to Epic and computer architecture? Um, it was an epic failure. <laughs> uh, there was three technical problems with VLIW. The first was very long instruction word trying to schedule it. First was unpredictable branches, that made it very hard to schedule. The second one was variable memory latency. So if you had a cache miss, it was very hard to software and schedule. And the last one was just the code size. It was called very long instruction words. The words were very long. So programs got big. So those three strikes uh, got it. And as uh, Donald Knuth, a Turing Award winner and one of the famous computer scientists of all time, said the Itanium approach was supposed to be terrific, but it turned out the wish for compilers were basically impossible to write. So that bet didn't work. And that's what we do in computer architecture. How do we, you know, we argue about RISC versus CISC or VLIW. What do we do? We spend billions of dollars on commercial products, put them in the marketplace, and see which one wins. <laughs> so it's a very expensive field to have opinions on. So. All right. And so given the tremendous fanfare around uh, the Itanium uh, and its doom failure, that didn't go unnoticed. Uh, it became kind of ridiculed by the industry, and somebody changed the name from Itanium to Itanic. <laughs> and so after an infamous uh, ship, and uh, the, this cartoon shows companies uh, abandoning ship and trying to get away from the sinking Itanic. So kind of remarkably, what happened was the emergency replacement x86 survived yet another life, right? So the things that they had three weeks, 10, 10 weeks to work on evolved, they made it from 16 bits to 32 bits, and now from 32 bits to 64 bits, and it's still with us today, despite two attempts by lots of smart people to find better instruction sets, you know, it survives. It's like, like, uh, like Dracula or something. You can't kill the x86 instruction set, despite serious efforts. Okay, so this will be time for part one of my comments. So, so what's the consensus of instruction sets today? It's not... CISC, we haven't had a microcoded interpreter instruction set proposed since, uh, you know, in 30 years. 
And it's not VLIW. VLIW, because of the three problems I talked about, didn't get you on in general purpose computing. However, <laughs> for digital signal processing, I found at home. Digital signal processing doesn't have, uh, the branches are easy to predict. It doesn't have caches. It doesn't have variable latency. There's software controlled memories. And the programs aren't that big, so the code side explosion is okay. So VLIW did find a home DSPs, but not in the general purpose marketplace. So the winner is RISC. <laughs> Who would have guessed 35 years ago, with all the changes in technology, that the conventional wisdom on the best instruction set in 2018 is RISC architecture? Okay, so to give you, to keep everybody awake, I'll, get, I'll pause and see if you've got questions or, or comments. There's a question in the back. They'd like you to use the microphone, or I will repeat them if you don't want to do that. Uh, if there's, uh, 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 the question is, uh, all right, why don't you hand it back and I'll say, uh, and there's a claim that uh, Transmeta was a successful VLIW. Uh, Dave Dissel's one of my students. I don't think most people would list Transmeta as a success. <laughs> I think it was an interesting thing to try, but I'm not sure how successful they were able to do binary compatibility. There was a brief period when AMD's server chips were actually faster than Intel's, and my um, uh, experience now is that you know AMD has fallen way behind Intel in server chip speed. Can you uh, just comment on why that has happened? Uh, so that's a harder. You know, why why did AMD? Uh, well, first of all, I think part of the reason they got ahead is they had the 64-bit address stuff done earlier than. Uh, Intel didn't. They had Intel had to catch up. Uh, if you uh, Hennessy, fortunately for me, John Hennessy, despite having this little job as president of a, a major university, continued to help write the uh, textbooks. We just had the sixth edition of our textbook come out last December, uh, and in there I went through the spec benchmarks to see the latest AMD and Intel ones. And if I at that time that when we published it. The difference was, uh, if you use the spec integer benchmarks, about a factor of two, and actually one of the benchmarks, because of Intel technology was, you know, ran 2,000 times faster than everything, so you should throw that one out. But it's about a factor of one and a half. So, they, so Intel has very good, you know, the world's, maybe the world's best semiconductor technology, and, uh, and I would say uh, using those benchmarks is about one and a half times faster. Um, and, you know, Intel's got really good people and really good technology. And uh, yeah, there's, they're uh, especially, uh, and, and you know, they're, it's uh, very good at that. But despite their best efforts for, for at least five years of trying to get it into low power embedded things, that was a difficult thing to do. Another thing that I heard kind of uh, in terms of ARM, ARM has, there's about 10 places that make ARM things, right? For Intel, it can only hit a couple of points. You know, it, it can't do 10 points at once. It's, it's hard to have many designs, so it's hard for them to get into the, to the uh, mobile market. They've been unsuc unsuccessful in the mobile market. Okay, why don't I do one more, and then I'll get back. Okay. Uh, isn't uh, SuperScalar and VLIW sort of different faces of the same thing? Don't they merge? And, and you mentioned compile problems with uh, Merge said by Damien, but we found that the compilers over years get a lot better. And can't that slowly fix some of these problems? The okay, let me see. Uh, the two questions, one of them had to do with compilers getting better for Itanium, and the first one is superscalar and VLIW. Kind of the fundamental difference between superscalar and VLIW is superscalar does not rely on the compiler uh, to work, right? It, superscalar uh, is binary compatible. So old binaries run on a superscalar architecture. For the VLI, the pure version of the VLIW, when you make it wider, you would recompile, oops, you would recompile, uh, you had to recompile, that's the pure version of the VLIW. Itanium tried to do that. If Itanium compilers are actually solved, work now, 10 years later, they're kind of 10 years, you know, whatever it is, uh, 10 years too late. Uh, I think Intel formerly ended the life did uh, the Itanium just a, a few months ago, uh, so it, but it missed, it missed its window. But, but um, uh, simply scan our uh, compilers well, the superscalar. Well, but it had it had a, the superscalar compilers. Compilers are aware of the microarchitecture to get performance, uh, but they don't have they don't have to work. Uh, it'll run 
properly, even if they're not perfect, right? But I think the VLIW bed is you better get pretty good performance out of the block, otherwise you're going to have poor performance when you when you when you're announced. And I think that's that's where yeah for them it, even if they're right, if maybe if Fisher is right, and ten years after the Atanium, the propellers finally work, the marketplace has moved on. Okay, all right. That was a little commercial break. Part two, domain-specific architectures. So, things are changing, right? The end of Denard scaling, I'm sure many people have talked about the ending of Moore's Law. And from the computer architecture side, we had these, all these ideas that under the hood we run faster, and the programmer didn't have to worry about it. Uh, but that ended with it running out of power, and we had to switch from a single uh, inefficient core to lots of efficient cores. But Amdahl's law, the limited, you know, you, there's only so much parallelism you're going to be able to take advantage of before you run out of core, so that kind of kicked in. We're going to be changed the products and servers. So uh, what's happened, this is the first figure from Hennessy's in my textbook that we've been doing over, over you know, for whatever it is, more than 25 years. And in the good old days, you know, before the SIS things, uh, the, it was remarkable improvement. It was uh, doubling every uh, year and a half. Uh, a, 50% per year. When Denard Staling stopped and the, we started running out of power, it slowed down to doubling every three and a half years. And then Amdahl's law started, but we went to multi-core, right? Uh, efficient cores. Amdahl's law started limiting the number of cores, so we slowed down to every double years. And I just, when we just updated the textbook this time, I was shocked to see, using the spec int benchmark, that for over the last couple of years, it's only been 3% a year, 3% a year, which is like doubling every 20 years. So we have hit the wall in terms of single-threaded performance uh, on microprocessors. So transistors aren't getting much better, ending of Moore's Law. The power budget isn't getting any bigger, electron migration and things. We've already done the switch. What's left? And as far as I know in talking to all computer architects, the only thing that's left is domain-specific architectures. That is, you're not going to try and do everything. You're going to try and do a few things really great and not worry about the other stuff. Let the a host CPU handle it. So now the question is, what are we going to accelerate? If you, what are you going to pick to work on? Well, at Google, at about uh, five years ago, they saw this excitement about deep learning or deep machine learning, as it's called, or ne ne neural networks. They thought that if uh, everybody, all their customers, would just use Google Translate three minutes a day, and they calculate how many CPUs they would need to serve that, they would have to double their data center. So they had an emergency project to start that in 15 months, kind of like Intel did with 86, in 15 months, we need you to build neural network hardware that could handle this workload so that we don't have to double our data centers, which we couldn't afford. So how fast is machine learning improving? So this is a slide that Jeff Dean uh, put together, and it plots on the archive, which is a you know, place that papers are published immediately, the, the number of basically machine learning papers relative to 2009, and the red line is Moore's Law. So the number of papers per, per day is going up by Moore's Law. So in twenty. <laughs> So 2017, the, if you were trying to keep up with what's going on in machine learning, you'd need to read 50 papers a day. And, and uh, God help us next year, right? It's, <laughs> so this is an exceptionally exciting field of many things going on. And we've all heard the story about you know, a machine uh, neural network-based software program beating the human champion at Go in last year. That Everybody mentions that example, but there's also Trans doing object recognition better. This is some of the technology that looks having self-driving cars. So it's a very exciting field. So that's the one that worked out. Uh, and we need a lot more computational power. It's changing. It's popular enough. It's changing how we're designing computers. So what are some of the features? It's not about. It's not a, a lot about precision. For machine learning, if they're trying to imitate a neural network, you know, reduced precision is fine. And then. The operations are matrix multiply. So if you were, if you got your wish list, if you, the architects get their wish at Christmas, what problem do you want me to solve in hardware? You would have picked matrix multiply, right? If it been, if it been alpha beta search or, or or pointer chasing, oh God, how do we do that? Oh God, oh God, matrix multiply. We know how to do matrix multiply. So it's low precision matrix multiply is a lot of what's going on. 
Now there's two pieces to neural networking that are pretty easy. There's the, the learning part or training, and that's being done where you're developing it. So you're, you're looking at data, it's learning from data, right? That's the training piece of it, that's what researchers do. And then once you've got something trained and it's gonna go into production or it does prediction, that's called inference. So Google wanted to do inference. Uh, because that was easier and because that was what they worried about doing the translations uh, for all the customers. Now the other thing about it, because it, the pre precision isn't that emphasis, although you would naturally think of doing it in floating point, you can also do inference in integer, and that's called quantization. So, and in fact, what Google did is decide to use a quantization, so they did things in integer for inference. All right, and what they built they called, uh, is called the TPU. At the heart of the TPU is that matrix multiply unit. Amazingly enough, it's 65,000 multiply accumulate units. It's 256 by 256 matrix. If you multiply its modest 700 megahertz clock rate by that, you get 90 tera operations per second. So how many max is that? It's like 25 to 100 times as many as in CPUs or GPUs. Now, the results come out in basically vectors into the accumulator, and that's four megabytes of accumulators there, and there's also a kind of a scratch pad storage, and that's 24 megabytes of scratch pad storage, which is like three times as much as the GPU. Now, some, you couldn't fit everything on the chip, so the weights that are associated with neural networking or parameters are kept in DRAMs off the chip at the top through uh, a DDR3 interface. Because they were in a hurry, they had to get it done in 15 months, they couldn't use more aggressive memory technologies than that. So that's a pretty standard technology. Much slower than what GPUs use. Okay, so that's logically, the, here's the floor plan. The, that's, whoops, there's the floor plan. The matrix, whoops, the matrix, okay, <laughs> one more. Okay, the matrix multiply unit is a quarter of the chip. That's the 65,000 max on it. The memory is about a third of the chip, so two thirds of the chip are just the memory and the multiply unit. Control is only 2% because they have a very simple control that's being done with it, so that's kind of the floor plan. In computer architecture, we grade on the curve, right? So you, what are you going to compare it to? Uh, so the chips of the time that we went into Google's data center in 2015 when the TV started working are called, were the Haswell generation, which had 18 core CPU, and the NVIDIA Kepler uh, one. Those are, by that, at least in that time, those were really big chips at about 600 millimeters squared. The TPU is about half of that. And also they use a lot more power. Uh, uh, they use a lot more power, about 150 watts, and the TPU is, is half that as well. So that's who we're going to compare to. Now, to try and present the comparisons, when you just talk about peak performance can be misleading. So uh, in, my past, in my past, one of my PhD students came up with this visual model trying to explain performance that relates memory bandwidth, uh, memory capacity, or memory bandwidth capacity and computation capacity. And he calls it the roof line. So this is the graph over here. So uh, what's the y-axis is a log scale is floating point operations per second. And so the, the peak performance for the TPU, that's 90 teraops, you can't go any faster than that. That's the speed of light. Now what the y, uh, the x-axis here is the bottom is arithmetic intensity, and that's the average number of operations you get for every byte you fetch. So it has a lot of operations, it's over here on the right, and it has fewer operations, it's on the left. So what this slope line is, it turns out when you plot it this way, that's the memory bandwidth. So how, what's the bandwidth of your memory forms this sloped part, and that's why we call it the roof line, because of those two pieces. So then if you have a lot of operations per byte fetched, you're over on the flat part, so you're computation limited. If it's few operations per byte fetched, you're memory limited. And so that's the idea, is to show visually. And so the question is, for your applications, you hear a number like 90 teraops per second over here. Well, that's interesting, but you want to know the question is, how many arithmetic operations per second is your application? Because it doesn't matter what that is, it's as if you're over here. Okay, now let's go look at it. So the TPU has a really steep roof because it doesn't have very good memory bandwidth. We use those DDR3 memories to get to it, and so that was relatively slow compared to its incredibly high operation rate. 
The good news is that the applications, if we look at the arithmetic density and what performance delivered, are very close to the roof line. So the idea of the roof line is that you can't go faster than that. So if you're near it, you're happy. That's at the limit of what the computer can do. So five of the six of them are pretty close there. Let's look at our competitors. Uh, the CPU has well. It's got uh, it's more balanced design. It's got uh, memory bandwidth versus peak, and you can see that's where those same six benchmarks are. The GPU is has a higher roof line uh, up there, and it's got even been much better memory bandwidth. So it's it's got a, it's got a, a more attractive shape because it's it's a lot easier to get peak performance uh, if you're to the right of this ridge point here. However, you may have noticed there was a big gap between the, they weren't popping their heads against the roof line, they were below it. The reason had to do with response time, which was, a, which was a surprise to us. So if you think about inference, it's dealing with user-facing user applications. So what the people who run those applications care about isn't how fast the throughput of your computer, they care about how fast it is under the worst case response time, 99% response time. So for the GPU and TPU, it shows the difference between if you didn't care about response time, how much faster would it be, versus you had to hit the seven milliseconds deadline for this application. And it's about a factor two and a half there. So for the TPU, which, do, which uh, is a very simple design, has one matrix in it, and in a single threaded, the, the gap is much smaller. So fortunately, because uh, even though we didn't know it at the time, or the architects didn't know it at the time that they did the TPU, is that its response time is going to be rigid. It's a pretty simple design, so it's not much variability, so it was very close, unlike the kind of traditionally what you do in computer architecture is you worry about the average case. But for inference, uh, uh, worst case latency mattered. Okay, so that's what it looks like when you put all the roof lines together, and all of the ones for the TPU, all the stars for the TPU are higher than all the, the roof lines uh, of the others. Now that's on a log-log scale, and at least I don't think log-log, so let's put it on a linear scale to see what they look like. <laughs> and so, yep, it's a lot faster. <laughs> okay, so in, in, on average, it's uh, about, the GPU is about twice as fast as the CPU in that case, the TPU is about 30 times faster, so uh, the TPU is about 15 times faster than the GPU. Now, from a data center perspective, performance is interesting, but what you'd really like to know about is performance per TCO dollar. But there's no way companies are going to release their, the TCO information. The good news is TCO is related to power, and we can release the power. So this shows uh, the performance per watt measured two ways in the relative performance. On the left is, you know, these are accelerators, so there's a host you plug them into, so this includes the power for the host on the left, and on the right, we just talk about the incremental, we ignore the host part and just talk about that. So if you look at these numbers here, it's a factor of 80 times the performance per watt of the CPU and about 30 times of the, of the, of the uh, GPU. Now you remember I talked about how the slow memory bandwidth, because of the, the rush there, uh, and you saw on that roof line, a lot of the things were under the slow part of the roof, which was meaning it's memory bandwidth limited. So the natural question is, what, if, what would happen if we'd use faster memory? Let's, what would happen if we use the same GDR5 memory that the GPU is on? So if we put the 2015 GPU style memory in it, what, what would happen in, in to performance per watt? And it jumps up even higher. A revised version with the same memory as GPU would be about 200 times performance per watt of the CPU and about 70 times that of the GPU. So here's a picture of the, of the board, and here is a picture of, of, I can't remember, 64 of them together. And this was actually the one that was used to beat the, uh, the Korean champion of Go. The, the, the AlphaGo ran on this hardware. Um, it's still, and it's still, you know, it's being used, you know, billions of people use this thing regularly. Uh, it's used for search and machine translation and so forth. Okay, a retrospective here, and this is a slide that uh, I got from Cliff Young just for you. It wasn't at ISSCC. So, you know, because of the compressed schedule, they put everything in software that they could, and that and had some features of insurance policy that worked out pretty well. 
The ASIC flow made the machine much lower power than they expected. You know, at, they were thinking it would be close to 150 watts, but it got, came in at 75, which was helpful. The architects thought they were building a throughput machine, but it turned out to have a low latency requirement. To their surprise, they talked to the application people. They didn't push response time the year before, but when it was time to port it, then they really cared about it. Why should you study computer architecture? Why should you buy computer architecture textbooks? <laughs> so, so three ideas from the 1980s, before many of you were born, were vital for the TPU. The first is that matrix multiply unit followed the idea called systolic arrays. This is an idea from 1980 where you can get, if you kind of orchestrate where the data flows through the array and they meet up, you can do this without registered accesses, which saves both power and area. So we, one of the big ideas was using systolic arrays in 1980. When we were fetching from the DRAM off the chip, there was an idea of called decoupled access execute, is that you uh, don't wait, you start the memory transfer, and you don't stop the instructions, you keep going and let the data catch up. That's called decoupled access execute. That's from 1982 from, by Jim Smith. And then uh, because we were shipping the instructions to the TPU over an I.O. bus, it didn't make sense to ship risk instructions, you know, one clock cycle. We had need to fix things that would take many clock cycles, so we used disk instructions right from the 1980s. So if, you, if you're young and don't learn history, you're going to suffer. <laughs> you need to buy textbooks, I guess. Maybe. <laughs> the quantization turned out to be harder than we expected. Uh, the, the early users were very sophisticated and were happy to, to do that, going from floating point and making it work in integers. Uh, not everybody wanted to do that. And matrix multiply turned out to be a great primitive. You can do lots of things with that. It, you can do mem copy if you put identity matrices in it. You can concatenate things together. You can stride, you can average. So it was a pretty powerful uh, tool to be used. And then uh, it was very, uh, you know, programming a single thread of control, unlike what the CPUs and GPUs did, which have lots of threads, made it a lot easier to do, and it also gave us that value of response time. Now, uh, the TPU V1, the one was, for inference, what about training? Uh, training is what all the researchers spend their time on. It takes, it takes, I don't know, it takes days or weeks to train something. When we're doing inference, it can take milliseconds. Can we do hardware for that? And uh, that was version two of the hardware that uh, Google announced about uh, last May. Uh, this is uh, for, does both uh, training and inference, does both, not just uh, one. So here is a version of the, the design. It has, uh, this is the so-called high bandwidth memory, so this is the same memory that you'll see in GPUs. That, you know, it's a technology stacking thing with interposers and stuff like that. There's two, what they, we call it tensor cores and a scalar unit in there. The memory bandwidth is between these is 600 megabyte, gig, 600 gigabytes per second. Sorry, the it's floating point because training needs to be done at floating point, and it's 128 by 128, where the C, the prior one, the TPU was uh, 256 by 256. There's, but there's two of them in there. It's reduced precision, and it does 45 uh, teraflops. Uh, here's a picture, and they, we put four of them on a board, so the four boards, four times 45 is 180 teraflops, 64 gigabytes of HBM memory, and t more than two terabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Now, that's a board, but this one, unlike the TPU, is designed to be connected together to build a much bigger computer, and that's what this one is. For some reason, it's called the pod, is the way they describe it, but it's 64 TPU um, 64 of those TPU cards, you can see the ribbon cables connecting them all together. That's collectively 11 petaflops uh, for machine learning and 4 terabytes of HBM memory. Uh, this shows the scalability on one of the popular image things called ResNet. And it's, so it's very close to linear scalability, uh, which is great. And uh, they, uh, it's programmed in TensorFlow, which is this open source thing that Google is running. It's kind of a domain-specific language for domain-specific architecture. Um, and it's recently it was announced it could be in the, it's available in the cloud. So the first generation TPU is just used internally. The second generation TPU for inference things are, is, is going to be in the cloud to rent. So uh, and they 
quoted a couple of uh, early customers that were very happy using uh, the version 2 TPUs. Uh, so wrapping up this before time for questions, you know, the domain-specific architectures are a thing. C general purpose CPUs are not getting a lot faster. Uh, that's the only thing we have to do. Deep neural networks are a popular area because they do lots of tasks. If you make it do, that, do neural networks, they get used for translation and search and ads and uh, games, all kinds of things. Uh, the first one is for inference. The second one is for training and uh, inference. And you're st if you start, you know, if you go online, you can start seeing people showing comparisons using the cloud platforms of GPUs and CPUs and at, on the cloud because anybody can use these things. Okay, so I'm ready. This you know, wake you up again for the next set of questions around domain ex accelerators and TPUs and stuff like that. Hi. In your pod picture with the uh, ribbon, ribbon cables, what's the signaling and speed on those? Cables? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you that for sure. Now, uh, well, this what I, now that I've uh, retired from a professorship and worked for a company, I have learned that you don't, uh, you don't reveal product information as part of a talk. <laughs> so uh, what we did for the TPU, first TPU, we, we wrote a very detailed paper that was published later after the announcement, and we haven't written that one yet. So. Uh, I, I can tell you exactly what's on the slides, and I can not tell you anything that's not on those slides. But we will we will write a paper that has all the details. Hello. Yep. So uh, as where here here. Okay. Yeah. Um, as a professor, former professor, and as a Google employee, how do you feel about the privacy implications and ethical implications of part two of the talk, like the business model of? Privacy or privacy uh, surveillance capitalism, as they call, as they call it, that you, that putting effort into that kind of technology that is ultimately used to spy on people essentially. I didn't follow that one. Yeah, how do you feel about using as an academic, not only as a Google employee, of putting your brain power in enabling? How do I feel about putting my brain power to build uh, uh, hardware accelerators? No, hardware that is, makes spying on people easier. What is it? Spy. Spy machines. Oh. <laughs> I guess I don't. You know, why is that a spy machine? I don't. Let's just limit the questions to that. I, 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 I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure spy. If you worry about spying, you should not be in the computer industry. <laughs> I think. I think everything is useful for spying. And, uh, I don't think this is any more useful for spying than anything else. Uh, so yeah. I have a question on computer security. So since you are sharing these TPUs in cloud that can be rented by uh, GCP cloud people, if their workloads are there, how, how do you keep them secured from... Yeah, so for the... Uh, well, you know the answer to this. <laughs> uh, so basically, uh, you know, Amazon, you know, in 2006 pioneered the idea of using virtual machines, and we bet on virtual machines to protect customers from each other, and I, I think Amazon's been, you know, when Amazon came out with that, it was... There was a lot of skepticism that people would ever use it, uh, because especially for sensitive data. And it's possible that that's flipped now, where given all the break-ins you read about people's own data centers in the news headlines of the newspaper every day, there's this question of whether your system administrators for your internal data center are better than Amazon or Google's system administrators in doing that. So it appears that virtual machines in the cloud is arguably uh, a more secure platform than, you know, people buying computers themselves and running them themselves. But virtual machines are the key technology, and so there has there's a mechan has to be a mechanism to use accelerators that honors the isolation. A few more questions. Yeah. Under lever here. Okay. So when uh, they ran the program that defeated the world champion in Go. They found that as the uh, program was learning how to play Go, after a while, it was doing things and, and executing strategies that nobody could understand. Likewise, in financial technology, now they can analyze a huge data set and they can say, you should buy this, and it works. And the customers say, well, that's great, but what is the methodology your computer developed? And the answer is, I don't know. Yeah. So you're getting you're asking me questions about machine learning, which is not what I write textbooks about. <laughs> uh, but uh, I could say for for the Go one, what I find really interesting is 
uh, I, would, I don't know that I would say they didn't know why. I would have said it differently. I would have said human beings for this complicated dream had turned out to have explored a pretty narrow space. And apparently if you want to be a goat master, you, you kind of memorize all games ever played. And originally, uh, the first version of AlphaGo uh, would um, learn those games and then explore on its own. But then they did AlphaGo Zero, the next generation, and it didn't get a starting point. It was, a, here's the rules of Go. Learn to play. And it's much more fierce. So you could argue that humans have, one argument about machine learning is humans have a limited number of things that they can understand, like this magical number seven plus or minus two. There's so much that we can keep our hand, and so we can, we can uh, explore a limited, when they're in a big space, we can only do it, those limited things we can do. Machines don't have that problem, right? They, if it's thousand dimensions, it can do that. So the kind of the machine learning argument could be, you know, it's just, there's more situations where hum humans are limited to what they can explore, and we can do this machine, uh, machine learning. The, uh, the area of I happened to go to the, the last December to one of the main machine learning conferences called NIPS, and what you're referring to is explainability, and that is an active area in machine learning. So, you know, off those 50 papers a day, there are people who are trying to work on how are we going to make it explainable? It seems like for things like loan applications and stuff like that, just saying no, would, or for health applications, saying no, or you should have surgery, it won't be sufficient, you'll need an explanation. But that isn't one of the active areas of that. Okay, I'll do, I, I have time to do, I'll do one more, and then I'll do the rest of my talk, and then we'll have questions. So, okay. I recognize that guy. <laughs> hey, Dave. By the way, Jeff Dean is uh, your academic descendant. You didn't mention it. You're too much. I didn't know that. Yeah, he's my great grandson. I'm, I'm your son, so there you go. But <laughs> I but, didn't know that. <laughs> so, so computer architecture. I tried to think of the best question I could for you. Okay. okay. <laughs> so we had uh, cost, we had speed, we had physical size. Then power came along, and that was a big change. What's the next big surprising change that's going to come along? that we're going to have to worry about as computer architects? Uh, I think I'm going to talk about that. Good, 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 good thing. Uh, I, I, get, I, I am going, I'm going to, get to start talking about Open Risk 5 and then I'll do questions until you get tired. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what I think the next one is. So good, good lady. Okay, so if we look at one of these SNCs that I talk about, there's a lot of instruction sets on it. There's the ARM one that everybody knows about, but there's all these others, graphics, DSPs, power management, with their own instruction sets, their own software stacks. Uh, and I one person told me that typically there's a dozen of them. So do we need all these different instruction sets? And do they have to be all proprietary? What if there was one that was free and everyone could use for everything? Well, what would that world be like? So RISC V is what started at Berkeley. It's called RISC V because there were, uh, in the 1980s we had three, uh, four generations of RISC chips. There was RISC-1 and RISC-2, and Dave Unger here was PhD student. He worked on what we called small talk on a RISC or SOAR, and there was a generation after that called symbolic processing using RISC, which is SPUR. So that's kind of the four generations. So I told the students in the faculty there at the time, I don't really like going back in history, but if I had to do it over again, I wish I'd been like the Illinois guys. They called it ILLIAC 1, 2, 3, 4. And I thought, man, it should have been RISC 1, 2, 3, 4. So I told them that story. So when it became time to do a new other instruction set, they decided that we were going to do a RISC instruction set on our own, and they named it RISC 5. And they used V for Roman numerals here because the RISC ones were Roman numerals. Well, why did we invent our own? Why did we use x86 armor? They're just too damn complicated, and we would have got sued. Intel was one of our sponsors, but even they didn't want us to use x86 because they didn't like the idea of an open risk out of there. So we, we did a three months project. It was led by my colleague Chris Sazanovich and two graduate students at the time, Andrew Warner and Vincent Lee. Let's do it brand new, clean slate, learn from the past. And it took more than three months, <laughs> but we were building chips and stuff like that. But a weird thing happened. If you teach at universities like Dave Unger and some of us have done, you get complaints from industry all the time about what you're doing, right? But this was a new complaint we never got before. Uh, we were using our, our classes in the, our instructor said in the spring, we changed it over the summer to make it better for the classes, and we got complaints from industry about changing our instruction set. <laughs> Why are you complaining about what we change for our internal courses? Well, the courses are on the web, 
there was people out there that wanted to have an open instruction set. They looked around, they couldn't, they were trying to find one that they could build that wouldn't have their proprietary restrictions, and they found ours and they liked it. So once we understood that, we thought, well, that would be a great idea. Let's try to make that happen. And so that's how RISC-V became uh, an open architecture. Uh, that's this question I want to ask, I just want to see. How many of you before, before today had heard of RISC-V? I just want to see. Oh, that's good, good. <laughs> I didn't want, I'm going to guess it. Okay, so what's different about RISC-V? It's really simple. The x86 is 2,500 pages. You know, if you were to spend eight hours a day, five days a week, for an incredibly boring job of reading that manual, it would take you a month to make one pass, right? And, and risk you could uh, risk five and do it less than a day. It's a clean slate design. It takes the good ideas of VAS, avoids the mistakes. It doesn't tie in microarchitecture stuff like delayed branches and stuff like that. It's a modular instruction set, which is kind. Of, it's kind of a new idea. There's always been well, you could leave out the floating point, but this is a real modular instruction set. The very base is incredibly simple. In fact, it's really close to risk one instruction set. They're almost exactly the same. And then if you want some other features like atomic instructions or floating point or even multiply divide, you add them but you leave them out. Why did we do that? So that it could be good for Internet of Things, a little time where every, every nanometer uh, matters. It's designed for extensibility specialization. We understood that we were entering this era of the post Moore's Law era of uh, the accelerator, so we wanted to make it easy to integrate if you wanted to bring it closer together. And it's stable. Uh, we there's the pieces are, have been done. They're frozen, and the other kind of thing that you didn't want to do is leave it up to some company. Companies come and go, and the instruction sets come and go with them. We've seen instruction sets move and things like that. And you didn't want to depend on a university to do this, so we started a foundation imitating like the Linux group. They have a Linux foundation or, or the uh, LLVM foundation. So we found, started a foundation and handing it over to them. Uh, in details, there's actually a couple of different instruction sets, 32-bit and 64-bit. Uh, the extensions that are optional are the multiply divide, the atomics, single and double precision, and they have a nice vector instruction set architecture uh, rather than the kind of clunky SIMD architectures that you see. Um, and a nice simple risk encoding to make it easy to build, and uh, it's been frozen for a while. The foundation is catching on, and we do workshops twice a year. The last workshop was last November, it was at Western Digital. The next one's going to be in May in Barcelona. There's more than 100 members of the Risk Foundation. There's more every week. What's really interesting is about how we're going to evolve the instruction set architecture. Is Classically, if you work for a company like AMD or ARM, you kind of talk, when you're going to change the instruction set architecture, you try to cost some customers, you carefully think about it, your engineers announce it, and then you release it out the world, and then all the software people complain about it and tell you how you screwed up and stuff like that. So because it's an open architecture, we don't have to do it that way. It's more like a standards committee. So we have a, a group that's interested in bit manipulation instructions, a group that's, what does it mean to be RISC-V, they want to work on that, a debug standard, what are we going to do about the memory model, the privilege spec, let's work on that, the new vector instructions, things on security, and so on. And we have that discussion with everybody in the world, all the world experts, giving the input in the beginning, and then we reach a consensus, and we adopt it as a standard, and that's the way we're doing it. So that's, kind of, that's an interesting opportunity for open source, is to bring all these people in, because not all, you know, one company doesn't have all the smart people in the world, this way we can rope lots of people into it. Uh, so, Answering, so what do I think? So I think clearly the domain-specific architectures is a big thing, but that's not the next big thing, it's the thing. I'm pretty, uh, I've been bothered my whole career about how bad, it's embarrassing how insecure computers are. It's just, you know, we're enabling purple-haired people in the Eastern Europe to be criminals that can steal money from well-meaning Americans and get away with it and never catch them. Right? Just, wow, we're enabling all that because we didn't worry enough about security. I think architecture is to blame for it. You know, what did we do for security? Let's see, in 1960s we did page level protection, okay, and we virtual machines, and that's from the 1970s. Not so much for the last 30 years. So what has happened, if you look at the, you know, when IBM came up with binary compatibility, that's basically their definition. What does it mean to, 
is what does the machine language programmer need to know to write a correct program, but timing independent? You know, you don't know how fast it's going to be. Well, what Spectre has shown is that speculative execution allows you to see uh, conflicts, uh, performance conflicts, and they can do timing attacks and reveal secret information. So by because we, we said architecture is defined as you don't worry about timing, but timing is something we have to worry about if we want to keep secrets. So this is a, an existential threat to computer architecture. As Mark Hill says, you know, one of my students in this thing, we need computer architecture 2.0 that defends it. So this is, this is a big deal. So the things that people may be poked fun at, at ARM and x86, they weren't bugs in their architectures. They're bugs in the definition of computer architecture. And they were just doing what was, what was done before. So what we need to do is, uh, well, how are we going to fix this? So I think RISC-V could play an important role. So the, you know, FPGAs are amazing in their, you know, their plasticity. You can change them and they run pretty fast. RISC-V has, because it's an open architecture, that enables open source implementation. So there are several implementations of RISC-V that you can just grab and download and start using, plug it into your FPGA. You get a full Unix operating system, full software stack, and so you have a real system that's pliable that you can play with. Now, it runs at maybe 100 megahertz, but if you're connecting that to an internet and providing some kind of service, maybe you don't have as many users, but it's a real thing, it's a real computer. So, and, uh, so this is going to be a great platform for, for trying out the security experiments. And security, my colleagues in security, in the past have often been just critics. It's like, oh, look at Microsoft, you have a bug in your interface, ha ha ha, right? So they're, but they're not putting something out there to get criticized themselves. This means they can do that. They can do a design, put it out there. And not only does that make it easy for people to do this in one company, because RISC-V is open, Everybody can work on this. So we can get people, smart people at universities or any organizations to work on this really critical problem of to improve the security. So I think RISC-V is a vehicle that could accelerate, you know, grab, accelerate. If we wait for the proprietary instruction sets for them to make changes, you know, it's like every two or three years. We could make changes daily. We could have lots of people working on this. So I think, you know, it's not only a great opportunity, it's kind of kind of as moral people, our responsibility in the architecture to make security a lot better, to do our part, which I don't think we've done. And we want everybody working on it. Okay, uh, if you'd like to do that, uh, Andrew, if you'd like to learn more about RISC V, Andrew Waterman and I wrote a very slim book, very cheap slim book, uh, like some other books on RISC V. And so let me wrap this up with questions. So yeah, to me, given everything that's happened in the last 35 years, I did not expect RISC still to be a good idea. Uh, this you know, this idea, like our colleagues in operating systems and compilers and databases, that we have open source ones that complement the proprietary ones, is exciting to see if it works. Since it's worked in software, I don't see why it can't work in hardware. RISC-V itself is a lot simpler, which helps with verification. It can help with security as well, because it's less attack areas. Uh, it's extensible. And it's got this competition thing. There's a small number of places you can work in and uh, make x86s or ARM, but everybody can work on this, which I think means more competition and better innovation. And our modest goal for RISC-V is, to, is uh, world domination. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the same instruction set and everything from your Internet of Things to your mainframe computers. Okay, with that, uh, I think I said all these things. Whoops. Yes, uh, you know, this is exciting times. I think we're going to see this new renaissance between RISC-V and domain-specific architectures. Venture capitalists are investing in hardware startups. What a remarkable thing to say. <laughs> it seemed like you know you had to be in software to get new venture startups, but according to the New York Times, he was able to count at least 45 hardware startups and you know hardware for machine learning uh, that, that's being gone, gone on today. Concludes our comments. Okay, with that, I'm ready for questions. Let's start here. Hi. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance for asking an architecture person this, but 80% of a microprocessor's life is really the ecosystem around it. And so I'd like for you to comment on the growing ecosystem around RISC-V yeah. because it's tiny right now. 
Yeah. So, what about the ecosystem around it? So, it, but this basically, kind of, this is like the, uh, this is like crossing the chasm, right? Any new technology is going to have weaknesses compared to the existing technology, and so I think if open source software had not been successful, it would be hard to be optimistic. So the question is: Is the community around RISC Five going to fill in the missing gaps on the ecosystem around it? I can, you know, like we didn't have a debug spec. Now we have a debug spec. Uh, why did that happen? Because the people in the community said, "You don't have a debug spec. You've got to have a debug spec." So there's pieces that are missing. We've got a really good uh, a GCC compiler, but the LLVM compiler is behind. So there's software pieces and bus standards and stuff like that. And you know, the interesting test for our, our field will be rally around the open source, uh, the open architecture things, as our colleagues in operating systems and databases did. And you know, what made Linux happen, I think, was not only the, the kind of the academics working in it, but eventually companies like IBM and others decided this is going to be important for our technology, put engineers on this. So you know, is that going to happen? The things I forgot to mention, though, even in its nascent state, is NVIDIA announced that they're going to use it as a microcontroller in all GPUs, so that's tens of millions of chips per year, and, and a few months ago, Western Digital announced that they're going to put RISC-V cores in all of their disks, so that's going to be billions, billions of uh, chips per year. So those are, and, you know, so the, the, sign, the early signs are good, but, you know, it's, you know, clearly the ecosystem isn't as good as something that Intel and AMD have been, uh, ARM have been working on for, uh, you know, for decades. But it's it's quite a bit cheaper. <laughs> uh, I, at the at the at the at the question of hardware vendors for Western at the uh, workshop, Western uh, Digital announced that they were investing in a risk five startup company called Esperanto. The day the Ditzel is listing. So, okay, yes. um, two small questions. First one from the history. Uh, have you seen any application of the so-called web pipelining in any of the? This modern is, day architectures. Uh, the question about wave pipelining, there's a startup company called Wave <laughs> that's doing, I think, wave pipelining, I think. Okay, I'll I find that out. But this, uh, by the way, all, all, as far as I can tell, all ideas ever invented in computer architecture are being investigated right now by startup companies. Oh, the, I, the, the, there's, the second. You remember wafer scale computing, the thing that sank Almdahl? And the, there's rumors that there's a startup that's even doing wafer scale itself. So. Uh, the second question, the, um, since Amazon is not one of your employer. Can you give some insight about whatever you know or can imagine about what Amazon is doing with architecture? No, I think I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I'd get in trouble for that. Too. <laughs> I, I think I saw some speculation that uh, in the publication that they were doing hardware too. You know, uh, I can't remember where I saw that, but there was some online place. I think they hired a guy who did a lot of FPGA uh, Excel. You know, so Microsoft is. Rather than doing chips, Microsoft has this project called the Catapult Project, where they're putting FPGAs in every server, and you're programming the FPGA to tailor it, which is an interesting idea. And Amazon apparently hired a person who had done a lot of FPGAs, and so people are speculating what they're doing. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. Here, okay. Uh, hi, Dave. Last time we saw each other, we were assistant professors in Berkeley. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, my question was back to the pot. When you have such a monster amount of computation, how do you carve it out between all the uh, applications that want to use it? Uh, if you can uh, well, say. this I would say. Let's see. So, uh, the, what's great? Uh, well, deep learning, uh, deep network neural networks have many wonderful features, and one of them is for training. Is these are giant jobs, so people can tie up hundreds of GPUs for days or weeks. So you don't have to have that kind of time slicing thing that you would need to have for a mainframe computer. So I'm not actually sure what the scheduling uh, plan is, but there certainly are tasks that would use all of that for many days. In fact, what Google is trying to, is figuring out right now is they put this stuff into the cloud, they're right now going to customers and see what they think. You know, what do you want, right? They don't really know what's going, going to happen here. And, uh, but there certainly seems to be enthusiasm for these, these large things together for training. Because you can train a lot, instead of training taking weeks, you, maybe you, with 64 things getting together, you could do it in, you know, in hours or something like that. But you know, this is what, I, I didn't say this, but this is a remarkably exciting time. This is 
why I think of it as a golden age in computer architecture, is there's all this demand for new ideas in, at the disability instruction set level. And one of the things we'll see is, you know, will these pods be incredibly attractive to be able to train really fast and really market there? And we're, we're going to learn that in the next couple of years. Where? Okay. Okay. Question about the precision. Um, previous, actually, you said the 8 bit may be enough for the influence. But for the training, maybe 8 bit is not enough. Can you actually elaborate that? Yeah, so one of the questions uh, the question is what's the precision you need for training? It's a thing I've been wondering about. There are papers that will claim you can get away with, uh, at sometimes training can be done with, with less bits. Uh, it certainly, uh, uh, NVIDIA latest chip has 16-bit floating point support in there, and there are things that run at 16-bit floating point. Um, colleagues at Stanford, like last week, announced a paper that, uh, where they think you can do training in the inner loop in 8-bit integers, and the outer loop is you accumulate in floating point. So it's a, an active area right there, and I, there's, not a, there's not a final answer. Uh, the, the default thing to do, and the reason GPUs are so popular, is just do it in floating point. 32-bit floating point is enough. I think nobody wants to do more than, doesn't, you don't need 64 floating point, everybody agrees on that. How much you need to do training uh, is still an area of active investigation, and if we can make it not area a, a lot narrower, that would help our memory bandwidth and simplify the chip. So lots of people are, lots of researchers are looking at it, but I don't think there's a final answer yet. It's another reason, it's something that fundamental you think there would be an answer to, but it just shows how new the field is that that's still open. Uh, if someone was to make a web server chip using RISC-V, how much better do you think it could be than an x86 server chip? Uh, well, x86 is a, a, a tough, I mean, the Intel's been building those for a you know, long time, and they're very sophisticated. Uh, branch prediction and uh, and uh, out of order execution and things like that. You know, three level caches and you know, there's a lot of architecture work in there. Now, if you uh, that's going to be the hard one. If you're kind of lower into the lower end, like Internet of Things or mobile devices, where you're not running a, a full Intel chip, that's probably a better opportunity for RISC V uh, because the instruction set, the benefits of the instruction set are more visible. Basically, the bigger the chip, the more aggressive the chip, the less the instructions that matters. And that's RISC-V's advantage for right now. Now, there are companies like this one I mentioned, Esperanto, that is trying to build a very aggressive design, to, I think, to compete at the high end with Intel. And so we'll see how that does. But uh, right now, I think the best chance is lower end, especially for the chips you can get right now. Where? Hi, Prof. Uh, I wanted to know your uh, input on newer radical architectures, which are more academic right now, like neuromorphic architecture. What's your take on that? Yeah, so uh, what's great, you know, uh, you know, uh, and Berkeley played a role in this, is uh, for a long time, uh, computer architecture has been driven by benchmarks. There was a time we didn't have good benchmarks, but for, I don't know, 30 years we, we have had good benchmarks, and that's how we make decisions. Uh, machine learning or vision things used to not have benchmarks. They just like, I've got a new vision algorithm, here's my picture, look at how good it is. Oh yeah, look at my picture. Look how, you know, so you, they were incomparable. But they have switched over and now do benchmarks and they actually have competitions to do that. So the so-called neuromorphic, which means kind of brain-inspired things, and well, there's uh, things like spiking neural networks that kind of imitate the brain. Until they start entering competitions and doing well, you know, how serious are they? And why are they afraid to enter at competitions, right? It's because they wouldn't do well. Uh, so th the value of the competitions, it goes with this thing that's called ImageNet. In 2012, there was this guy at Toronto, Jeff Hinton, said, I think convolutional neural networks are going to be great for images. And called up a colleague at Berkeley, and why don't you believe me? He says, well, you don't enter at competitions. So he called back a month later, if we entered this ImageNet competition and we won, would you believe me? Sure. So he got a PhD student to work on that, and he, uh, he put it into. You found a GPU to work on it because it was floating point, and uh, because the student didn't want to write, 
uh, his advisor, Jeff Hinton, said, well, as long as you improve the accuracy 1% every month, you don't have to write your dissertation. So he, he, worked, he worked hard. In December, they submit, and they won. And they won, and they crushed it. Uh, they, they were much better. So the second year after that, that was 2012, 2013, somebody else won, and there was a handful of neural network entries. In 2014, it was 100% neural network, right? So the field, the competition changed the whole field, and people had, it was kind of like uh, saying about AlphaGo, they had all this code, all the right way to do it, and they threw all that code away and used much simpler algorithms, trained in a lot of data, and that was better. So that, the field was forced to change as a result of competitions. So if neuromorphic or spiking things are really better, then, you know, there's a vehicle how to convince people how to make that change, and, you know, so we have to wait for them uh, to try. So, okay, I'm not controlling the mic, but I <laughs> um, Hi, you mentioned uh, domain-specific uh, architecture and FPGAs. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, because not every company has uh, monies like Google to make their own chips with a domain-specific design. So do you see FPGA in the future uh, serves a compromise between uh, the uh, chips and the general purpose? Uh... Yeah, part of, the, part of the question is whether it has to be expensive to keep building chips. Uh, there's certainly work that's being done at Berkeley to try and make that a lot, a lot easier to do. Uh, I do know, I was surprised, one thing, one of the benefits is uh, with where Moore's Law is today is the tiny little test chips that you do that are a couple of millimeters on a sign. They have a lot of transistors, millions of transistors. So amazingly, you could, uh, you could go to TSMC and for $30,000, you could get 100 chips, tiny chips, that have millions of transistors on them. So you could do prototypes that way. And there's languages that, uh, that are much make it easier to design than Verilog to be able to do it. There's one at Berkeley called Chisel. So we're trying, and there's people trying to work on bringing that cost down. So if... You know, if it has high enough volumes like deep neural networks, a custom chip is probably justified, but there's a whole long tail of things that it doesn't make sense to build a chip for. And for those, I think FPGAs are a pretty good use, right? But, you know, for neural networking, I think you can make a case that you should be building chips, which is why there's 45 companies trying to do it. So that's going to be that kind of investment, uh, you know, frequency, popularity is, is, is going to, well, I think we'll see. Hey, hey Dave, I'm sitting here remembering in the 80s when I was studying architecture with you and we laughed at certain technologies including data flow and artificial intelligence which had this promise for all these years and, and, and so turned out there were some things we were wrong about and that happens, the world changes and you're wrong. But the, the question is, what are the, some of the things we all believe in this room that yes, might that turn out to be wrong tomorrow. For, first of all, uh, let me talk about AI. The difference, what's winning today, the people in the field make a big distinction between AI, writing logic rules, and machine learning. Those are two different groups. That, and they, some, they don't, some of them don't like being lumped into AI. So the machine learning group tends to be problem, statistics, problem focus, solving a problem at a time, and it's working, right? So the, the AI in the past, followed by the AI winners, were leaders of the field promising things they couldn't deliver for. And that happened a few times. Says, wow, next year we'll be able to do this. Look at what we can do now from this simple example. Next year we'll do this. What's happened, the difference now for machine learning is it's, the excitement is about them doing things, like you know, commercially viable for language translation or for object recognition. So I, I don't know that we were wrong about AI. I think the logic-based AI stuff uh, uh, didn't work. For data flow, it, data flow as a hardware technique, the classic MIT data flow thing, hasn't caught on. The thing that did work is the out-of-order execution stuff. That actually goes back to the, you know, to the, to the 1930s, so I don't know if you're wrong there. I don't, the thing that everybody, <laughs> what does everybody believe that... Uh, that might. You don't, you don't have to be absolutely right on everything, but give me three if you can. <laughs> 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 three things that we all believe in that could be wrong. I, I don't know that I can... I'll, I'll, next question. <laughs> I'll, 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 if I come up with it, the, by the next question, I'll answer. Okay. <clears throat> yes. The one thing that you didn't talk about is uh, supercomputing. Uh, it was a hot topic um, also in the history of computer architecture. What do you think the future of supercomputing could be like? Yes. So uh, it's been 
you know, interesting, we talk about parallelism and stuff like that, and kind of, somehow we characterize the problem of uh, parallel execution of a single program is the thing we have to do. And that didn't work so well, you know, but the cloud is amazing, you know, it, it's the biggest computers ever built. Uh, uh, James Hamilton, who's kind of the chief scientist for cloud at uh, Amazon, did a paper as how many data centers do we need? And he, what he said, which, you know, Amazon is a lot of real stuff. Let's say a leading company has order, 10, uh, order 100 data centers. He didn't say how many, but 100 now. Okay? How many will we need to fulfill uh, the demand out there if all the on-premise stuff came in the cloud? He said 10,000. 10, so we need 100 times more data centers out there. So that's a phenomenal success of what the lay person would think of supercomputers. You know, warehouses with... 50,000 servers, you know, uh, 30, 60 megawatts, you know, giant computers. But we don't think of them as supercomputers somehow. <laughs> but they're up all the time. You know, if, 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 if you went, if Google search stopped, that would affect all of society, right? You go to Google, and you hit search and say, sorry, <laughs> doesn't work. Like, all oh, society would change. So somehow, we don't, we, we, we don't classify that as a supercomputer, but it is totally successful. Supercomputers, like from the DOE and things, have been, uh, you know, scientific uh, sci computers for scientific computations so far, and haven't been worried about, haven't had the same interest in availability and stuff like that. So they haven't played as big a role. Uh, they, because some supercomputers are using GPUs to be their their, their computation engine. They come along, if they buy the latest ones, they're going to have this accelerators for neural networking in it as well. So this will be kind of interesting to see, to see will um, supercomputing start used for the neural networking stuff, and will they have to worry about availability and things like that, like the, the cloud has. Not my, not my fault. <laughs> Would you comment on, on the near um, in-memory computing or near-memory computing, saying those uh, domain specific architectures? Yeah, so there's, there's people, I, I'm sure some of the, I bet some of those 45 startups are doing processing near-memory. Uh, the uh, Western Digital announcement was arguing kind of philosophically that they want computation near the data, so that's why they wanted the computation near the disk, if you do processing on the disk. Uh, um, Micron has a, uh, a design of a processor in your memory there. And, uh, you know, I think, um, I think, yeah, kind of the higher level statement to make about this, maybe that's my answer to Unger's uh, question, is kind of surprisingly there's a bunch of ideas we've rejected for general purpose computing along the way, like some of the ones I've mentioned. In domain specific architecture, it's, it, it, there's, they don't have to do everything, right? They can just do some things well. So I think in domain-specific architectures, we can look at a lot of ideas that got rejected in the past and say, that's going to work in this case. So, uh, you know, a, a project I did the Iron, with some students, the IRAM project, we did processor in the memory. That could well come back in this context. So it, because it's domain-specific and likes to do some things well, we could see a lot of ideas make sense that don't make sense in the other applications because they only have to do that one thing. So I expect to see this kind of uh, cornucopia of architecture ideas, and that's why I think we're going to be in this renaissance of all kinds of very different things that are very different from uh, the processors today. Um, so you, you mentioned the IA42 earlier as kind of the greatest thing. 432? 432, sorry. And, and I just wondered if any of those ideas have filtered down into RISC-V or... Is anything to uh, close to that? There's there's enthusiasm in uh, there's capabilities or there's people excited about capabilities to try and work on security. Uh, there's an effort in Cambridge, I think it's called Low Risk, and they're looking at putting capabilities back in. We actually kind of as a joke defined a 128 bit architecture just because we could, and there are people who are excited about 128 bit address space. They think that that'll let them address a lot of things and put security things in there. So, um, and there's, there's another capability group uh, that I can't think of that's working on that. So yeah, there are ideas now that are starting to surface that people are interested in around capability, primarily because of the security concerns. Okay, so we're already past 8 o'clock, so let's close the meeting now. 
Uh, and then uh, perhaps you could, if you have any further questions, you could uh, just follow up with the speaker uh, offline or, or by email. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.